welcome back to the 8-Bit Guy. So in today's episode, I'm going to be restoring these three disk drives. Now, all three of these disk drives have two important things in common. First of all, um, all three of these are third-party Commodore drives. Now, what I mean by that is they're disk drives that work with the Commodore 64, VIC-20, 128, etc., but they weren't made by Commodore. And there's a fascinating legal battle that we're gonna be talking about in the next episode. <laughs> but for now, on this episode, we're just gonna to try to get these things looking good. So um, the second thing that is important about these drives that they share in common is that all three of them either have missing or damaged badges. Badges? We ain't got no badges. Yeah, these two are actually completely missing badges, and this one has a damaged one. So I'm gonna be retrobriting possibly all three of these and, and then trying to construct some brand new badges. We don't need no badges. And so there's different ways that we can make badges and I'm going to experiment with some different ways and we'll see what works best. I don't have to show you any stinking badges. Okay, step one will be just to clean the surfaces. I bought this blue chip drive on eBay a couple of years ago for $1. <laughs> and it looks like it was pulled from a landfill. So um, let's try some Windex on it. Yeah, that's cleaning up really well. Um, it looks like the top cover is less yellowed. Um, maybe the original owner left the top off while it was in use or something. Um, anyway, uh, this one was pretty easy to clean up, and I couldn't get this stuff off here, so hopefully when I retrobrite it, that will clear up. But uh, yeah, as you can see, there's no badge on the front. Let's go ahead and disassemble the drive so we can retrobrite it. Uh, I've never actually seen a design like this with these long metal screw stalks. After removing the shield, the thing that surprised me the most was to see a genuine MOS chip in there. I mean, this was a third-party product that Commodore was furious about, so where did they get this MOS chip from? Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and remove the board. Not all of these screws are the same, so I'm definitely keeping them organized. Now, let's remove this front lever. Oh wow, this is uh, also neat. They have a metal piece in the lever for additional strength. I wasn't expecting to see that. Moving along, let's get this front bezel off. Time to retrobrite. I was going to use my usual crate, but being this is December, hence the Christmas decorations you're seeing, even at solar noon with the sun at its highest point, it's still coming in from the south this time of year, and my crate is just too tall. So I'm going to try these smaller clear crates, and I'll start by rinsing off uh, some of the dirt inside. And even though we have sunlight, it's about 50 degrees outside right now, so I don't know how long this process is going to take, hopefully no more than two days. I'm going to set a timer on my watch to remind me to come out and check on this every 30 minutes to make sure nothing has floated to the top or anything. While waiting on the Retrobrite, uh, let's move over to the Accelerator Plus. Uh, this one's in pretty good shape already. I think the front faceplate may need a little Retrobrite, but the main concern is the condition and wacky placement of the badge. And here is the Enhancer 2000, uh, the one I think will need the most work. And uh, it's a little bit grungy, so um, let's get that part cleaned up. And now let's turn our attention to the leftover adhesive. I'm going to let this WD-40 sit for 10-15 minutes and then we'll try removing it. Okay, so 10 minutes has passed and some of the adhesive came off, but uh, not much. So let's try something different. Okay, so it has been suggested to me that I use a plastic razor blade like this instead of a screwdriver and that hopefully that will prevent more scratching to the surface. Unfortunately, with the layout of this, uh, I can't really go uh, like this because it's uh, recessed, but uh, hopefully, maybe I can work on it like this. Some bits of it were coming off, but I started to get the impression I was dealing with more than one problem here. I even tried lightly scraping with a screwdriver, but ultimately no more adhesive came off. 
I think what we have here is two different kinds of adhesive. I think one of them was super glue or something with acetone in it that could melt plastic. And so I think the original label had uh, one kind of glue and eventually fell off. And then the previous owner tried to glue it back on with a different adhesive. And that's the only explanation I can come up with. But uh, being that I need this surface to be uh, somewhat smooth, I'm going to use a sharp screwdriver and try to scrape the plastic smooth. So in this case, I'm purposely pressing down really hard to chisel away the melted part of the plastic. On the bright side, once we get a badge made for it, you won't see any of the scratches I'm making, but the smoother surface will help it adhere properly. And now I'm done. And it may not look so great, but when I run my fingers across, I can feel that it's considerably smoother than it was before. However, this does bring up another question. I'm not sure this needs retrobriting. After all, this scraped area should definitely be the original color, and I can't see much difference. So, um, how to make a badge? Just as a recap, I made a new badge for the IBM PC Junior that I restored a while back, and the way I did that was I designed a new label in a paint program, and then I printed it out on my label maker using a special black on clear label. And then I used a piece of aluminum tape and cut out a square to fit the recessed area. And then I applied the label to the aluminum tape and ended up with a pretty decent looking badge. It wasn't perfect, but it would certainly pass a casual inspection of the PC Junior keyboard. In fact, here it is compared to the original IBM label on the computer. So this is one option we can use for making badges that are monochrome, but the Enhancer 2000 has color in the logo. My first goal was to design a new badge, and all I had to go on were some of these photos that I found online of the Enhancer 2000. And while I didn't take any video capture of the design process on this one, um, this is what I came up with. It took me almost two hours to design this, trying to match every part of the font and all of the proportions exactly. And it's still not 100% perfect, but I think it's close enough. And um, I took a trip over to my brother's house, and you may know him as Mike from the Geek Pub, and he has a shop with just about every tool imaginable. In fact, he's almost done fabricating his own R2-D2. And um, I thought maybe he could help me create a metal plated badge. And we did look at several options, including this very thin aluminum. And we even talked about cutting up a soda can and making the backing out of that. The one problem was, however, uh, the recessed area on the Enhancer 2000 is not as deep as you'd think. Not like a Commodore products, for example. So we eventually decided to go another route, which turned out to be much easier. Um, first, he measured the height and width of the recessed area. And um, then he took my artwork into Photoshop and set everything for the correct size. And then he printed it on one of those little photo printers. The technology behind these is actually fascinating. And someday I'd like to do a video on how these things actually work. Um, anyway, needless to say, they don't use ink or toner like a traditional printer. Anyway, um, there we go. That looks pretty good. And um, then he just used a razor knife to cut it out. And then we did a little test fit. Uh, we need to trim the corners a bit, but uh, otherwise it fits perfectly. Next, he used some 3M spray adhesive and let that sit for 30 seconds. And there we go. It actually looks fantastic, but it's probably not as durable as the original badge. But it should hold up for the documentary I'm going to be using it for in a few weeks. Moving over to the Accelerator Plus for a moment, I'm going to start by measuring the label, which, by the way, was 47 by 12 millimeters. And typically, I want the image size to be 10 pixels per millimeter, so that's 470 by 120 pixels. Now, this time, I stored my work every few minutes, so you can sort of see the process for how I made this. I started by figuring out the exact area where the logo went, and then also marking off the area where each letter would go. Then I started working on the letter E, which, by the way, was used three times in the logo, so I can just copy it. And then some letters can be modified from another letter without redrawing the whole thing from scratch. And there it is, the finished logo. Now this one took about an hour to do, and now I'll just print it out on my label maker. I'll use the common black on white labels for testing, and now I'll compare with the original label. I think it's a pretty close match. Now, I predict some people will likely be saying I didn't use enough resolution on my image. So to prove why this is wrong, I actually spent some time and modified the image with the resolution doubled in both directions. And sure, on screen here, it looks a lot better. But how does the new print compare with the old print? To the naked eye, they look exactly the same. But what if we put them under the microscope? This should be very telling. So here's the first version. And now here's the high res version. 
The pixel pattern is a bit different due to the way the image was processed by the label maker software, but there's no real difference, and that's because the resolution of these label makers isn't all that great. But still, to the naked eye, this thing is so small, nobody's really going to notice. So what I'm going to do now is use this black on clear cartridge in my label maker. And I'm going to essentially do this just like the PC Junior badge I made a while back. So I'll cut out a piece of this aluminum tape, preferably in a spot without any dents. And then, as you can see, uh, once I peel the backing off this, it's a clear label. So I'll just put this down in the middle of the aluminum tape and, of course, cut off the excess. And so here's my new label as compared to the old. It's not perfect, but I think it'll pass. Now I can peel the old label off, and one thing I noticed right away is that the color of the plastic is different under the label. You know what that means, right? <laughs> yep, I need to retrobite the faceplate, so let's take this thing apart too. It's actually pretty easy to take apart. Wow, this thing is really compact inside as uh, compared to a 1541. There are uh, just two screws holding the faceplate on. However, I had some trouble removing the front lever, and um, it was really stuck on good. And then later I realized there's actually a screw holding it on. Um, I've honestly never seen that design before. Uh, once I removed the screw, it came off easily. Also, the LED appears to be glued in place, so the only way to truly remove the faceplate is to unplug the LED, which means cutting the zip tie. And I'll just put this right alongside the blue chip parts, which are now on their second day in the sun, and I'm not convinced this is going to be enough. So I came back out around sunset on the second day. It's time to see if this is going to work. As I'm rinsing them off, I can tell some pieces look better, but others not so much. Okay, so how are the results? Well, um, this is the top piece, and it already looked pretty good anyway, so the top piece is perfect. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, can't complain there. Uh, the back piece actually looks great. Uh, no complaints there, and that was not that great before. Now the bottom looks actually really good because there was a bunch of weird discoloration before, so that looks good, but the sides on the bottom are still yellowed on both sides. So that's a problem. Um, but the worst part is the, the front faceplate. It's, uh, I mean, it's a little better, uh, no doubt, but it's just, it's not as good as I wanted it to be. Um, and uh, the handle is fine. Now this is for the uh, the other drive, and unfortunately I don't think there's any difference at all. If there is, it's just, just mild improvement. Um, okay, so the main problem is it's, it's just too cold outside. I think that if this had been summertime, these, these would already be looking fantastic. But uh, I'm still convinced that if I were to leave them out there another two or three days, uh, even with the cold weather, they would still look pretty good. The, the main problem is I don't have another three or four days uh, because starting tomorrow is supposed to be overcast and getting even colder um, for the next week or so. So uh, that being the case, I'm going to have to move to another method. I tried putting some of the smaller pieces on the stove uh, like I've done before, and somehow I lost all of the footage of doing that. Okay, so I cooked these for several hours, and to be honest, I am just not happy with how they came out. In fact, in many ways, I think this one looks worse than it did. It's just a little bit splotchy. So I have been forced to seek an alternative method. Um, I picked up this black light today for like five bucks. It was literally the only one I could find for sale. I mean, I could order something way better online, but I don't have time for that because this is kind of a rush. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick that in here and, um, well, let's just see what we can come up with. I'm going to take this aluminum tape and line the inside of this bucket to help keep in as much of the UV light as possible and reflect it back at all angles. Keep in mind this is an experiment. I have no idea if this adhesive will even hold up in submerged water. I mean, this stuff is meant for outdoor use, so I would hope it will hold up, but we'll see. Also, the black light I have is incandescent, which really produces very little UV compared to a fluorescent or LED style black light, but I'll have to make do with it for the moment. Um, let's go ahead and screw that in there. I'm going to add some weight to these pieces uh, to keep them from floating to the top. Yeah, I think that'll work. Um, that means I can let this sit overnight without worrying about it. And now, I'll just add some hot water from the sink. And, of course, some high strength hydrogen peroxide. And last, I'm going to add in some extra foil to keep in all the UV and heat from that incandescent bulb. I let that sit for a few hours, but uh, when I went out for my walk, I went to the mall since it was cold outside, and I remembered that Spencer sells black lights too. So I went in there and I found this nice fluorescent bulb. These things actually output tremendously more UV light than an incandescent bulb, uh, since fluorescent lights actually only produce UV light and the typical coating on the inside of the glass converts it to visible light, hence why they're called fluorescent lights. Now, this one just lacks the coating to convert the light. 
And so, um, I'll just let this sit overnight like this. So, another 24 hours has passed, and I'm going to check on the progress again. I can definitely see improvement already, but I'll need to remove it and dry it off to be sure. Subjectively, it looks much better, but uh, I need an objective way to measure it, so let's compare it with the other plastic piece. Looks like the top is a good match, but uh, you can still see some yellow on the side, so this piece will need another day. Um, however, the faceplate for the other drive looks about as good as it's going to get. I can no longer see the bright spot under where the label was. So I'm going to work on the bottom piece of the blue chip drive now. I've attached a weight to it as well to keep it submerged. Switching gears a bit, I've reassembled the Accelerator Plus drive and it's looking great. Now on the rear here was some permanent marker where somebody had labeled these ports. And apparently I forgot to take video of that, but I did clean all of that off and I don't think they were labeled from the factory originally, but what I've decided to do is make a nice looking label for these ports. So um, yeah, I think that will be a nice addition and probably what they should have done from the factory. Now let's put on the front badge, which is what this video was supposed to be all about before we got sidetracked with retro writing. And there we go. I think that looks great, and I bet nobody but a very knowledgeable collector would ever spot this as not original. So yeah, I'm very happy with the outcome of this drive. So back to the blue chip drive for a moment. It appears the Retrobrite process damaged the coating on what was left of this badge. I tried to scrape the rest off so we could just have a solid metal finish, but I ended up scratching the crap out of it, so I've just decided to remove what is left of this badge. And being this one was missing most of the badge to begin with, I feel I can hardly make this thing worse. And so here's the new label I printed out. Again, designed all by hand based on a photo I found of the internet, which you can see here. So after cutting it to the correct size, I can peel off the backing and you can see it's white text on a clear label. And so I'll just apply that down here and there we go. I think that looks pretty good. Uh, definitely better than it was before. Okay, so believe it or not, four days have now passed. Each day this gets a little better, but it's slow going. And honestly, I just can't wait any longer. So. However this looks today is going to be it for now. Um, the best way to see how this is going to look is to stick the pieces together. Well, this is a little disappointing, and while it looks better than it did originally, the pieces still don't match. Now, how did the aluminum tape hold up? Well, not that great. As you can see, the tape has peeled off in many places, and what's even more interesting is after I remove the water, uh, there's all this residue all over the tape, and I'm not sure if this is tape adhesive or aluminum oxide. In fact, I wonder if this was uh, using up all the hydrogen peroxide by reacting with this stuff instead of the plastic, so I think the tape was a big mistake. Well, let's go ahead and reassemble the drive, and here we are. Everything actually looks pretty good except for those two side areas that I just couldn't get to whiten any. So overall, I think this project was a success. Um, I'm happy with the Enhancer 2000, also very happy with the Accelerator Plus. And the blue chip, well, I'm not thrilled with it, but it'll have to do. I think it's important to show the failures along with the successes. That way we can all learn from my mistakes. But um, I think in the next couple of months, I'm going to invest some time to build a proper indoor retro writing contraption based on some of the experience I gained using this little makeshift thing as well as some other YouTube videos I've watched where they had a little bit more success. And one of the things that I've wondered about is if UVA is really the right way to go. I mean, that's what these bulbs, um, that's what they emit. But I've often wondered if UVB or UVC might actually work better for this process. Unfortunately, both are dangerous to work with, but I think I can build a contraption to use them safely. So I think I'm going to do some experiments on that next, and we'll see how that works. And um, the other thing I wanted to do was experiment with a soda blaster. So I hope to do both of those things uh, sometime in this uh, coming year. Other than that, uh, this this video was supposed to be about rebadging. And I think that uh, I successfully rebadged all three of these. I mean, could have been better, but I think it worked out pretty well. But that's it for the moment. So um, stick around for the next episode and thanks for watching.